is walking meaningfully into the audience. <laughs> Note that down. I'm one of the people. <laughs> I'm deliberately walking around to make it more difficult for the guy with the camera. <laughs> okay, I, I reckon we're, we're ready to make a start. I'll write notes. Um, thanks very much for coming uh, coming along. Uh, the the thing that we wanted to do, I wanted to sort of get a conversation going around was around a sort of a, the concept of a of a uh, national cyber safety strategy. And uh, as I pointed out in the email I sent out the other day, I don't know if you got it. I I don't actually work for the government, so so we're not we're not going to write the national cyber safety strategy here. We can't can't do that, but we can. Um, we can actually show, show some leadership and, uh, and, and construct something that, um, that other people will um, use or, or, or lean on or, or act on as a, as a national strategy, hopefully. And, and my objective for this workshop is, is hopefully that we'll get some of the framework of that in place. And then uh, from this point forward, NetSafe can continue to develop it and, and promote it. So, so I'm hoping we can be quite, quite constructive and, and productive. So why, why have a strategy? Um, Cyber safety is, uh, as, a, as a field is really growing, um, and there's a lot of organizations coming into the space, and there's a lot of issues that uh, by volume have, have grown, and a strategy gives you some point of coordination, something to coordinate uh, activity around. Um, a strategy is helpful because we have to make choices in safety, so uh, a good, um, you know, probably the best example of, of the choices you make around safety is, is around filtering and technology choices, so if you, um, if you want to uh, filter traffic for the uh, sake of um, protecting people from certain content, um, you know that, that's actually a choice you make between the output being filtered traffic and, and the other impacts that that has. And you know, how do you make the choice to filter or not to filter, what to filter, that kind of thing? That, that's where a strategy would be, be helpful. And also, um, <laughs> the board of NetSafe, my bosses, they asked me to write a sort of a state of the nation report. And I needed a framework for that, so <laughs> I thought that actually a safety strategy would be, be helpful. So um, uh, just to give a little bit of history around how the kind of, I mean, New Zealand has an approach to cyber safety, of course. Uh, in fact, um, I, I'm very lucky as part of my job. I, I travel around. I go to other countries, and people say, oh, you know, you guys in New Zealand, you're so switched on, man. You're so well coordinated, everything's. And I thought, oh, well, you know, as long as you don't pop down and visit us, you won't know any different. Um, but actually, we have, I guess, just as a result of being quite small. You know, New Zealand is a small country. We all sort of we, we know each other. I mean, even in this room, you know many of the people who are here by name uh, and certainly by reputation. Um, and uh, but what has happened is that that's grown organically. So uh, you know, NetSafe was uh, was created out of a membership group. Uh, lots of education groups have taken interest in cyber safety. The unions, the, that sort of thing. Um, you know, in terms of uh, cyber safety, you've got activity at the DIA that grew out of the censorship uh, activity. Um, you've got NGOs that have an interest in cyber safety that grew out of their traditional mission. So uh, uh, one, for example, is the um, ICPAT, uh, who's a child protection agency, essentially, and uh, obviously cyber, cyber issues came into their business, and so they developed some interest in, in cyber safety. Some countries have cyber safety strategies, so uh, some, some countries have specifically written a strategy, but it tends to be very much a, a, a child safety strategy, so it's quite uh, narrowly uh, focused. And of course, the problem with setting, uh, saying, well, this is our cyber safety strategy, and then just focusing it on children, is that um, you, you can make choices in terms of uh, activity di directly designed to protect children, which actually has a negative impact on, on other people. And I mean, this conference is an audience that fully understands that the, the choices that you make in terms of the benefits uh, of protectionism against the, the losses in terms of creating an open um, platform for innovation. So I, I would like us to take a broader view and think about cyber safety for all New Zealanders as our strategic, as our goal. Uh, and I would like to stop speaking also because this is not supposed to be a presentation from me uh, and start getting some, some feedback and some ideas. I hope that someone from NetSafe is taking notes. Sean and Lee are here, and Sean would never take notes. Lee, are you taking notes? Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
So uh, I thought if we, unless people suddenly want to burst in with ideas, uh, I thought that we could start with um, an icebreaker. No. <laughs> Left or right. I found this game. I don't know if you guys have seen it. Um, the, um, just to think about our, our mission or, or our, uh, our vision in terms of what our strategy is trying to, to achieve. So anybody want to have a crack at vision and mission? Come on, I'm not going to do it for you. Yes, Mia, you want to put your hand up? Something along the lines of to ensure that um, the full benefits of you know the online space can be enjoyed. It's necessary to promote you know awareness of and collaboration between key stakeholders about safety, so that you minimise the bad stuff. Something like that. Yes. Yep. I was going to say, if only we had two microphone runners. Who are you hiding there? What are you hiding for? You come Hi, I, th I think it's really hard to think about cyber safety without thinking about the chilling effect that an online presence has on our ability to be truly three-dimensional. Um, and I think, I th I think the, the, that's pretty obvious that um, online relationships cannot have the, 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 um, ca ca the, the uh, an online presence tends to be two dimensional in, in, in that what we reveal to people that we're more intimate with is different to what we reveal to the world as a whole. And yet the online environment doesn't really allow us to differentiate between those two groups of people. That's the first thing. And then the other thing about um, cyber safety, which I think is, is kind of kind of coming at it from a tangent, really, is the whole idea about forgetting. Every generation up until this point has been able to forget, um, you know, parts of its um, background, the way that it might present itself to peers and colleagues and friends, and yet the online environment is in danger of us of preventing us from forgetting in that we've, we will each have a, uh, a, a, a load of content that describes our lives that is not necessarily something that we forever want to be associated with. And I'd be quite interested in talking about those aspects of cyber safety. So you would like part of our cyber safety strategy to, to have the right to be forgotten? I would like to have the... Um, the word cyber forgotten, <laughs> um, and, and I'm, I'm being a little facetious, and maybe I should be in the troll session, but um, I react quite strongly to that. I'm not the only one. I've heard other people say it as well. Can we, can we you know, maybe try and move forward to an online safety or something, something a little bit more um, modern? Yeah, okay. I, to be honest, I'm totally happy with that. Um, the, the history of it is that at first there was um, the internet, and then there were other communications technologies, and so people said, oh, we need a term for, that can, encapsulates everything. And, uh, and that's where the cyber thing came from. And uh, in a way, the internet's kind of grown back to take over all of those other technologies. So, so I'm quite happy to call it internet safety or, or net safety or, or whatever. Plus, um, we've found that when you're dealing with youth, cyber is a shortened version of cyber sex. So uh, you can't say cyber anything <laughs> and, and continue to be taken seriously. So, so I'm happy to call it internet safety, net safety. Uh, one of the big take-home messages from last year was that the kids are the solution. So, um, in a wider context, the people that we're trying to keep safe are their own solution. So, any sort of policy has to be around the idea of empowering them to change their passwords, to have the virus scanners, to look out for false links and be able to spot phishing attacks, in which case, any sort of policy has to centre around the word empowerment. Empowerment, OK, that's good. Um, I think that any policy really needs to focus strongly on education um, and aiming at um, groups that are not often targeted, um, thinking specifically of uh, people with cognitive disabilities or developmental disabilities I uh, went to a disability studies conference last November and a number of 
stories I heard of um, quote unquote success stories. You know, this teenage girl had never had any social life and organization gave her an iPad with connection and suddenly she was on Facebook and meeting people and that was great, but nobody discussed the fact that she'd given her real name, her real date of birth, her phone number, her address, and um, the potential for horror stories are great. So we have to think in terms of education for um, high-risk populations. I'd also like to sort of second that, but um, coming from the Information Security Forum, one of the key things they also mention is that we're only secure as we have our connection. So if we go to our business, our security also depends on that business's security. Our IRD de details depend on the IRD security. I mean, you can call up, um, so long as you have an address, a phone number, and a name, you can log in and get passwords changed through the IRD and get the IRD details sent out. And with government security, um, and also with business security, we don't actually have reviews, we don't have anything to sort of post, these are the key details that you need to know. And what we had from Pamela Jones Harbour was that even the admin passwords for Twitter could be easily guessed. Um, just, it's a, just a dictionary single lowercase word. And we do find that in companies, the very first password they give you is something that can be guessed as well, the company name. Um, with a couple of digits on the end or something very simple. And so we trust those companies to store our personal data just as much as we trust ourselves. And if any one link in that chain goes down, then all our data and our security also goes down. So I think it's education across the board. It's not just personal education, but it's also corporate and governmental education and security that also needs to be considered. I am I just, often the word safety. I think conjures up certain very, you know, kind of very specific and often quite narrow um, connotations about what what safety means. People talk about antivirus and those kind of things, and, and maybe there's a bit of a security safety kind of crossover. You know, we heard people talking about a little bit of argument yesterday about whether or not the internet was a place, um, whether or not it's a place, or, or that we've got to do things, or whether or not it's just a mass communications medium. And if we um, if we accept that what we heard yesterday is that at some point the internet's going to be the fifth largest economy in the world, then it really clearly is a place. Then maybe maybe safety is not the word, and maybe we should be looking at a, a broader citizenship concept. So rather than safety, we should be looking at a strategy for for digital citizenship, that rather than just a, a safety strategy. Sorry to. No. Brilliant. This is uh, Sean from NetSafe. He, he works with me, so that's uh, so annoying for him to raise that. I guess I should put the case for the other side, uh, which is. I mean, I'm guessing the room is self-selected somewhat, but we're, tr we're, we're, in, we're here to be open, you know, we, we believe in an open and uncapturable internet, and in a way, maybe we, our, our, in terms of safety, we should think the same way, that first and foremost, it's about opening access to everything, so not having ridiculously asinine passwords and, and, and crazy laws and over-educating people, but accepting that culture is moving on and that... Uh, you know, we, we are intrinsically less able to control our, our own information and so on. And, but also that most people are voting with their feet and saying, I'm happy for the trade-off of giving Facebook all my information um, so that I get these net benefits, right? That's what people are voting for. And I'm, I'm not, right? I'm, I'm basically dropped out of Facebook, but, you know, look on Twitter, I'm all over there. And I think everyone has to make their personal choice on that stuff. So... I just would, would advocate that let's not go too far in one direction and say, gee, we have to be safe regardless of what, that, that when most people are saying, you know what, I don't care so much about that, um, let's educate them, but let's not lock, lock the whole thing down. Um, uh, I'd... We'll go to the troll session. <laughs> <clears throat> I was just at the um, meet last night um, with NetSafe, and one of the things that came out of that, just to go back to the word um, uh, cyber, you know, safety and things like that, um, was this concept of not sexifying up the word, but making um, making it broader than this sort of 
outmoded, outdated cyber word. Um, and just some of the comments that are going around. Um, I've chosen the chalk face to use uh, the concept of digital diligence as an adult, but also in teaching. Um, from the point of view that, to me, digital diligence covers cyber safety, cyber citizenship, and uh, digital literacy which are huge in their own. You know, these three strands are massive, but somewhere along the line, um, through working with um, students, we've got to educate them across those three strands. But also as adults, I think it, then there is the ownership of your personal diligence online and what that encompasses. Um, your comment here about um, people from various walks of life uh, not fully understanding what they're uh, entering into in terms of uh, tools that are out there. Um, a diligent adult will understand with any model of so, uh, social networking that uh, in order to give away information, uh, there must be, you know, we're working with corporations, so what are they getting out of my information that I'm giving away? So that kind of thinking other than, this is fun, this is great, I just get to connect. Um, so developing, to me, the word uh, or concept of digital diligence encompasses, um, I think, in a really smart, sophisticated way, the things that we're talking about for adults and for, uh, for to the youngest child. Um, I was just going to, um, you know, I agree that people make the trade-off between <clears throat> being able to use Facebook or any of those particularly free things um, and give away their information, but the, the crux of it is for people to have the knowledge of what they're giving away, and I think that that is where, what we lack at the moment. People don't realise, and, and I get pe we get people at NetSafe who report things all the time that say, well, how could my password be, you know, compromised on Gmail or Yahoo or whatever? You know, how, how could my Facebook be compromised in my contact centre, uh, an email that I've been mugged in Spain or whatever? People can't understand that their information isn't safe. So that's where the education around that, then they can make an informed choice about what they're doing. Um, I did a little bit of homework on this because I'm a nerd, um, <laughs> reading Martin's email. And I think there's a couple of things that need to be included in the strategy or that it can help build. And one of those is actually like a common language and lexicon for this. Like, I mean, cyber, I don't know too many people in the industry who like the word cyber. No one does, but governments use it, so it ends up getting used. But what do we mean by that? What is safety? Um, there's the, you know, the concept of feeling safe versus actually being safe. And um, possibly also looking at and linking in with, you know, prevention first principles, you know, like basic crime prevention, you know, theories and concepts, um, and also probably some basic do's and do not questions, like broken down to a really simple level. Um, like, don't plug in a USB you just find on the road. You know, like, that gets people all the time. Mm. But it seems really common sense. Not that I not. find that many USBs on the road. I find heaps. Cause they've got <laughs> heaps of good stuff on them. <laughs> just lying around outside the office. They're there every day. Yeah. Uh, actually, basic security principles are ignored by end users all the time. There was a recent case where some USB sticks containing malware were dropped into the car park of a company that was apparently being targeted to obtain its, its secrets. Um, in that case, this was um, reported on the schneier.com blog a few days back. Um, there's all this business of... <coughs> sorry. Um, when you connect up to some service or another, you might choose a good password for yourself, and maybe, if you're lucky, they um, encrypt it before they store it. But then there's these questions to identify yourself. Now, how many of you managed to give your first pet a name that's at least eight characters long, contains at least one uppercase, one lowercase letter, some numbers, and punctuation marks? Because if not, that's as vulnerable as a bad password on password recovery and things like that. And there's this whole level of things that if you really want to protect your online identity, you need to follow. The other alternative is to teach people that online identities are inherently disposable. If it asks for your real name, give a bullshit name. And if anything goes wrong with that account, walk away and start another one. And that's another valid choice, but people are not being presented with it. If you, you know, I personally, I operate online using my real name. 
on Google Plus and various other places. And I've never had any problems with that personally, but I can understand that other people would. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of reasons why people wish to remain anonymous or shoot anonymous or whatever. But they have to think about it right up front. Before you sign up with Facebook, you're allowed one Facebook account. Are you going to give your real name or not? Are you going to talk about your real self or are you going to talk about some image you wish to present? And then there is the whole thing beyond that of employers demanding access to people's Facebook accounts so they can see what they're saying in private. Um, hello? Where's the separation there? But it, it, the whole thing, I'm not, I'm, I haven't got any solutions. I just wanted to point out that there are so many issues that go down the path further on. Joy? Thanks. Um, just a couple of points. One is to go back to um, this question that Lance was raising earlier about the open and uncapturable internet. And I think it's a really... Um, I think it's a really important point because I know that with some of the groups that I work with, women's human rights defenders, for example, who who rely on an open and uncapturable and uncensored internet in order to really find each other, talk and communicate, um, and who, who very much would defend um, no liability for internet intermediary, um, empowering themselves through their own online security strategies, uh, at the same time feel frustrated uh, at the lack of agency that they have about complaints about what happens online that threatens their security, being stalked or... Um, uh, or other things. So I do think a cyber security strategy, if we're to call it that, or if we're to develop a strategy of some kind, needs to actually balance these these competing and actually sometimes problematic sets of, of values um, that you know that we have as internet um, users and act activists. Um, but I also think that it, it's helpful to sort of open source security policy. So, for example. Um, the organisation that I work for, um, we're developing security policies for or for NGOs and civil society groups. You know, which is not about um, uh, you know being nice to people online necessarily and not using racist, sexist language, but basically basic things like how do you back up your data at home? Can you use encryption? Um, you know, what are your first aid policies for rapid response if your website gets attacked? Those kinds of things, which I think also empower people to take control of the technology uh, rather than put them in kind of a passive passive space. Um, and I would certainly want any, you know, would like to see any security strategy focused on on that sort of holistic approach to, to security as well. well. One of the, um, so, you know, one of the things we could do as a community, picking up that point, is to say that uh, we, we specifically don't want safety to be used uh, as a as an excuse to breach other rights. Right? And it's, the language is a bit rough, but um, it, gets, it gets you into an interesting space. Because as you know, and, and you go to a lot of international conferences, um, the, the issue of uh, well, sometimes child safety is used as a lever to, to bring in um, mechanisms to control population. So it's, yes, child safety is a very uh, motivating topic. And, uh, you know, in New Zealand, we could quite specifically state that we don't want safety to be used in that way. That could be part of our strategy. Yeah. Jamie. One of the things I'm always amazed about when people go online is they tend to adopt a different posture around, you know, there's their just common sensibilities and, and safety. For some reason, they think that when they go online, they can behave differently, and I think that's counterproductive. In some respects, I think... Developing a safety um, strategy that's specific to online is actually going to be counterproductive. I think what we need to look at is, if you think of the way you engage with people in normal everyday life, um, when you're, say, at a dinner party or something with a reasonably small group of trusted friends, you're going to be a lot more open and um, you know, convey a heck of a lot more. But the posture that we all take when we're, when we're in the crowd, when we're, when we're in a crowd, is very, very different. And people just need to understand that that posture you take in, in meat space, so to speak, when you're in a crowd, is a similar posture that you need to take when you're online. So um, I think we need to look at how we behave in a crowd, in, in meat space, and apply those principles when we're online and just remind people all the time that you're operating in the crowd. I call it the idea of, you know, you are you all the time. So, you know... I this idea that online and offline are two different worlds uh, is not particularly helpful often. 
do you have a microphone? Oh, you do. Go. Um, so basically, I want to give my perspective from like I'm 21, so I'm relatively young, and um, I have a younger sister, and so I started on Facebook when I was 17, and so I've been on it for the past you know, five years, and. Um, Recently, I started dropping off from it because I realised that, you know, you've got 500 friends. You've got friend, people that you're friends with that you just met randomly once and people that you met at school 10 years ago and you're following all their status updates and things like that and they're quite reactive because it's a very, like, emotional place for young people. They just react. So I started unsubscribing and from people and managing it so it was just like I was there so people didn't feel rejected and they could use it, but managing my own presence so that it was more secure for my own life and stuff like that. But then I noticed that my younger sister, who's 17 or 18 now, but all her friends and stuff like that, they don't have any of that awareness around how they should be managing what they're doing online and what they should be saying and what, you know, they don't really realise that once you put it there, even though you delete it, someone could have got it in a different way, you know, or captured it, and then that can be used against them or whatever. So I think that, for me, a big part of, like, online security is making sure that, obviously, when you're older and you've got maturity and understanding around how you should manage your own life, it's easier. But for teenagers who just sort of want to do their own thing and not listen to anyone else, there sort of needs to be a way to reach them so that they realise how important it is, because in five years, they won't be able to go back and reverse what they've been doing now. I just want to ask you a question. Where, do, where, do, where are they, your, your teenage, um, your, your sister and her friends, where are they learning about this stuff and where did you learn about it? Okay. Well, they're not. <laughs> they're not learning from, it, from, you know, from anything. Like I was saying, you realise if you do this, you can't take it off or delete that status. It's not acceptable. You know? I've got to, I'm, I regulate them. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's, well, yeah, but it's still, they don't have anyone else. You know, there's probably a lot more teenagers and a lot more kids that are doing that. And their parents don't really understand Facebook because they're not using it. You know, but slowly more parents are. But because they don't understand what's going on, they can't control it, you know. And I'll see really silly things like photos where they you know, got barely any clothes on. And you're like, no, get that off. That's not acceptable. But, you know, there isn't really anything that's targeting them. And, like, they're going to be the people going into the workforce and all those different things. And they just don't really understand what they're using and how they're using it. They just emotionally react. If I could reply again, but I think there's two meme, a couple of memes in here. Right? One is that society is changing such that it's not that unacceptable anymore to have silly pictures and statements about what your activity were, was when you were a teenager online. It's just kind of how it is, and I think that's something that older generations will just have to live with, and younger generations just get it. Um, and the other one you said that was, that was interesting, though, is that the parents are changing. So the parents are increasingly online um, all of their lives, and this may be just a generational thing that after 10 or 15 more years of this stuff, um, everybody gets it, all the young people will get it, they grow up with it. And I know for yeah, yeah. maybe people in this room who are digital natives um, with children, uh, I have some friends of mine the same, that their kids just get it, right? They don't have to be um, taught or anything. Well, the microphone's oh. trembling <laughs> Uh, interesting thing that came out of there is, uh, in terms of strategic things, is recognising the importance of existing structures of support, so siblings, families, uh, schools, that kind of thing. Um, I just really agree with both those comments um, about you know uh, society changing, um, and definitely I think that we're going to see that sort of in ten years because those digital natives are just going to be seamlessly doing things, um, and we're in this flux of change where teachers are trying to grasp what's going on. Teachers who are towards the end of their careers, some of them, and we've got parents trying to grasp how to control the environment because they're concerned for safety and kids just running with it. So I do agree that's going to sort of shift. Um, it doesn't mean to say that they are going to read the conditions in terms of privacy, et cetera, that are attached with all of these sites they use, um, that, that they necessarily will continue through with the development of wisdom and how they use them. Um, you know, you can be a user, but not necessarily a wise user. Um, so that's the point. Um, I think that's really important where education comes into it. Um, just your comment in terms of your sister and her friends on Facebook and things like that. 
Um, it is just really common in schools for, and, and I don't mean to sweep this across New Zealand, I come from Hawke's Bay, but in Hawke's Bay province, there are kids who are in year four on Facebook um, in schools. Now that's really young, and their parents may or may not know, there are kids whose parents don't know they're on. Um, they've got on through an older sibling or something like that in the school holidays, and they're on, and um, they haven't a clue what they're doing. Um, you know, so that, that's an interesting sort of thing in terms of you've got your teenagers not necessarily knowing how to handle it. My next point um, is that the converse of that is about education with uh, teenagers and, and older, younger children is developing a concept of branding themselves online and un understanding how they can develop a brand of who they are and that that's managing their reputation, reputation management um, concept and going forward and teaching that, how well they could actually utilise those tools to develop an, uh, you know, an online brand of themselves. So some of that brand stuff is captured in the idea of digital citizenship that, that Sean tried to raise that I stopped him. Um, but actually that's part of the reason that uh, that term digital citizenship has come to replace cyber safety because it took a bro broader view of what it means to be safe. Richard. Kira Martin, just, the, um, just going back to the original question about the strategy, I've got a name in Māori that we could use. It's called Tu Matanui, Tu Matanui, which means clear, open and transparent. Not always practised by Māori, I've got to say, but uh, in the sense of, of the, a strategy that needs to be clear, open and transparent, that might be a, a good starting point. Um, just my view on social media, in a, in a Māori context, and we, want, we don't want to be called digital natives, we want to be called creative natives, um, or be cre-native in our thinking. So, you know, me personally, I use Facebook uh, primarily for my family, and I'm very, like the young lady, very uh, exclusive in terms of who I want to be on my own personal Facebook, so every, all the chatter I hear is from family or whanau members from around the world. But then we also set one up for our marae, and all we did was set the... Uh, the uh, Facebook profile up with a picture of our marae and 700 of our whānau uh, just signed up as friends, you know, and that's a very inclusive and, and, and a lot, lot of it's just chatter between whānau, uh, just connecting with one another, but they've got a forum now to be able to connect back to their marae. So from a marae point of view, we basically just push out a lot of information about what's happening and what's coming up. So a very positive way of actually, from our point of view, from the marae point of view, using the Facebook technology to engage with our young people who we have no other means of doing it actually to be to be honest uh, and then we have business uh, Facebook where we so I try to divide the use of Facebook into what I'm actually trying to achieve and I think that's a lot of people what are you actually trying to use Facebook for I now don't put pictures on Facebook I, I, I do a lot of checking in status and I put a photo up uh, just for a one off but if, if I don't want it to be uh, reused uh, I just basically don't put it on Facebook but uh, if it's there it's there for anyone to use or reuse uh, however they see fit. Eh? So, so I think too much to know from my point of view uh, will just create a different language set and a different, especially when you translate into English, what, what we're trying to achieve with a, a strategy. Uh, you know, and if there's some very good comments that have come out of today's uh, session, I think uh, you know, put it under a new title that may, may get away from cyber uh, and maybe a different way of looking at it. Um. I'd like to um, also um, see if I can reiterate Bruce's point in that we do kind of want to protect the right to being anonymous online as well. Because if you've ever been a teacher for a school, having your students not only try and stalk you, but also use your personal information to your own detriment. And that's happened quite a few cases actually. And then also being able to keep safe your own personal data. I mean, with Facebook, um, it requires that you put on your real name, is one idea. But you don't realize how much a developer also has access to other information that you put on that website. And it sort of it holds a carrot in front of your face that you can't use this app unless you allow it to access that information. And so it requires you don't know quite what you're sharing with that app, and you don't know quite what that app is going to be doing in the background. And so any of the advertising or... Um, I've been working with the Facebook apps myself, and it's one of those things is that you can gather so much information from it um, just by saying that this person has agreed because they want to play a game. 
And if they want to play a game, then you have the right now to take all that information from them. Uh, can, can I ask, um, how many of you, uh, you mostly Facebook users, I, I imagine, or have a Facebook account, how many of you have gone to look at a video or play a game or something like that, got the pop-up that says, this app wants to access these things, and then thought, eh, you know what, I don't want to play that much. So actually, that's working quite well. So uh, you know, good on uh, Facebook for, for making that, that transparent. And we, we talked about that, that, that making choices, people being informed, uh, you know, that's information, and, and then you know, people have got that choice, which we've been exercising uh, ourselves. Um, I just wanted to possibly caution against the assumption that society is changing. I mean, that's something that adults have said about kids, you know, forever. I mean, the teenagers of the 1950s are not still driving around, you know, cars with giant hairs and flick knives and listening to, you know, the same music and running society like that. They grew up, they put on suits, they run companies, um, countries, you know, all sorts of things. You know, it's a, it's a bit dangerous to assume that because, you know, children and teenagers and are uh, pretty not risk adverse. I mean, that's just, you know, a fact of being a kid in teen, you know, teenage years. Um, and it's changing, you know, the way in which they engage with the world and they exhibit their risk-taking behaviour. But if it's there in 30 years' time, you know, we don't, we don't know that that won't affect them. I mean, you know, the, admittedly it's satirical, but the Onion's, you know, article about all presidential candidates for the 2040 um, presidential race excluded due to their Facebook accounts from when they were in college. I mean, you know, it's, you, you can't, we don't know. So to assume that today's teenagers will be comfortable in 20 years with everyone being able to access that is, you know, potentially dangerous. I think the assumption is based on that all teenagers will have something negative in their digital footprint. So the negative digital footprint will never, no longer be a defining issue for the, for the people. Um, there was some down here, wasn't there? Yeah. The um, just... Oh, sorry. Um, so I'm quite pessimistic, given that these companies that are making these very useful tools are working in their interests, not our interests. Um, so Facebook makes it difficult to work out exactly who you're sharing things with. And um, the app developers are trying to grab as much as they can without... Uh, dropping too many of their users, and um, I mean, the Android permission system is similar. You yeah. find that just about every app wants every permission, and you're like, why does it need that? Um, I know Whisper Systems produces uh, an, an, a version of Android which lies to the apps. So, so you want my contacts? Sure, but the list is empty. You want to know where I am? Sure, I'm always here, or GPS is never working. Um, that sort of thing uh, is working for the consumer rather than for the app developer um, or for Apple or for Google. Um, so there's some improvement in areas where that can be improved, but things like Facebook where I don't really see how Diaspora or uh, anything else is going to replace um, Facebook or the big commercial company that replaces Facebook, like Facebook replaced other people. Um, so I don't really see how that tra transparency about what we're doing online is ever going to be made better because there's such huge commercial pressures for it not to be transparent. Um, and the other thing I'd like to point out is that these um, services combine in unexpected ways. So I don't know if you've seen um, Girls Around Me, but it was an app which did a join between Foursquare and Facebook. And so, um, well, yes, <coughs> but that's because it was too public. Um, if that flew under the radar, it would have um, stayed around longer. And the APIs that it used are still there, so you can create another one um, or drive the websites yourself. Um, that's pretty hardcore for its intended audience. But basically, it found all of the uh, people who had a, a public Foursquare profile, so it knows where they all are, and it found all the people who had a public Facebook profile, so it knew a lot about them, and it presented all of those people who are near you. Um, you could find men, but it was pretty obvious what it was for. Um, so just looking at one service in isolation, um, 
isn't necessarily enough when you're trying to work out what's going on. Okay, we, we probably, I think we're coming towards the end. There's quite a few people who want to make comments, so if we keep them quite uh, brief. Yeah. yeah, just very briefly, talking about the history in today's teenagers that was mentioned down there before, it really sparked something in my mind. Now, my teenage years were in the 1970s, okay? Hopefully, there is very little accessible record of that time. But one thing that scared me when I thought about it was the people who didn't ever do anything bad. And I would hate to see any of them in positions of power now. <laughs> OK, good point. Mark friends over here. Uh, yep. A <clears throat> uh, couple of key things that come out from a real high level, from a more the back to the strategy type stuff, is education and choice. I think what everyone's sort of talking about is part of your strategy is having education being, not education of kids, but education of everyone in general about what's appropriate, what's responsible, what's required as far as, as far as the strategy goes. And the other one is choice. So giving, uh, having the right education and responsibility to know what is the right choices when uh, on the internet. So a lot of schools today, I mean, I work in a uh, filtering service, they're cutting right back what, um, sorry, they're allowing a lot more of what the kids can access but it's making sure that the kids can make the right choices where they go to something, once they get there, is it appropriate, is it right, who do I notify, what do I do? So education on making the right choices that are from that high level strategy stuff. It'll be quick. <laughs> um, just sort of after listening to everyone talk, including myself, sort of with discussing the whole security strategy thing, I guess, what, when everyone put their hand up after you said who has clicked the do not allow thing when something pops up and you said well it's becoming more common well, most people in this room are IT based they know about all that kind of stuff there's a huge portion of people who don't know about that and I'm guessing with a security strategy whatever you want to call it what we should be focusing on is how do we reach the people that don't know anything about it how do we get them involved and how do we understand what they don't know before we start deciding what they don't know? Yeah, one of the most difficult questions in terms of balancing when you, the safety strategy for me is that how much responsibility for that mistake or that choice lies with the individual or lies with the provider? So uh, take that as a, an example where Facebook is, you know, the app is there, you've got a, an accurate, assume, a list of the permissions you're giving uh, that, that app. If the consumer is not really, uh, doesn't really understand the choice that they're making, whose fault is that? I'm not saying that they're yeah. not accountable for that. It's, if, everyone has their own responsibility to manage their decisions. But if we are going to be people that are trying to help people make better decisions, shouldn't we first sort of realise what the majority of people don't know? Like, wouldn't that help? I mean, I know it's a hard thing and it seems impossible, but when we're making such big decisions that are so important considering how fast everything is moving, how do we... Just, we can't just set out like A, B, C, D because we think it's best. Like how do we get more people involved so that we can understand where they're coming from and why they're making those decisions? Because if half of my friends are in this room now, they'd have no idea what was going on. You know, I have to, you know, they just, way over their head. And that alarms me because... Half of my friends too. Yeah, but you know, <laughs> but it's such a big thing and we all use it all the time. So I just don't really understand how people aren't interested in it. And I mean, I wasn't overly interested in it either until I started working in the industry. But once you do get involved in it, and once you know, like NetHill is great because, you know, they're opening up for everyone. And I think it's more important that we, you know, it's been a common theme, but you know, how do we get everyone involved? So that when we're making a security strategy, lots of people can put their input in. I won't respond just next door here. Just really quickly, I mean, I think one of the th principles of safety really is um, particularly for young people, if you're not paying for the service, then you are the product. And to me, that's pretty fundamental. So I, I think one of the, the challenges that we've, we've been discussing, and, and, and it's become clearer during this discussion for me, is one of the first questions that was posed, which is that what's the definition of safety? And what's become clearer is it means different things to different people. And even if you, you track an individual, it means different things to that person throughout their life. As Laura said, her, her perception of 
the safety and uh, the, the trade-off of Facebook has changed just over the last few years. So any strategy uh, shouldn't focus on young children. It shouldn't focus on teenagers and or parents. It needs to take into account that uh, people will decide their own level of safety and a, a strategy needs to take into account that the same strategy should work whether it's the teacher or the student at the same time. They, there will always be trade-offs there will and it will evolve. I think it, building on what someone said before about, about risk, this idea that you know, teenagers will and always have taken risk, I think it's probably important that any strategy recognises that it's not just that risk-taking behaviour is not a, it's not a bad thing, that it's actually an important part of, of, of development in terms of how you, you learn to deal with these things in the future. You talk about your, um, your younger sister and she puts these pictures on. She'll either experience, it'll either be a good experience for her or a bad experience for her or you'll talk to her about what's going on and she'll learn from that, but she'll learn contextually. She won't learn from somebody saying the five things you must not do about pictures are the following. And I think your strategy has to, your strategy? Any strategy has to, um, has to embrace that idea that, that risk is not a thing that we should fear. Risk is actually a thing that we should embrace and, and learn from. Does anyone know when we're supposed to finish? Oh, I could have passed. Oh, we've got five minutes. Oh, great. great. I was rushing people. A bit more time. So just picking up on a uh, couple of points that um, some people have made, I think, uh, yes, while, while the Facebooks and the Android apps are coming up with the list of things that you can do, um, there's also that pressure to play or pressure to um, partake in, in that application. So, you know, if it's the Farmville and they want absolutely everything, then sure you're going to do it because your sister and your brother and all your friends are doing it. So although you don't really want to give away those details, perhaps, you're going to jump in. And there's, there's that pressure, and I think the application providers and Facebook and all the other guys are doing that quite well to just kind of keep pulling those little bits of information out. And it really does come down to the uh, point of where do we put the uh, fence at the top of the cliff in terms of educating the people. And as Mike said, that strategy can't be focused on any one group. Um, what, what I've found going into some of the, the schools and having some of the discussions I've had, you know, they've put the filters in place and they think that's it. You know, we've put technology in place and technology is going to save everything, but it's, it's the thing between the keyboard and the chair that's making the ultimate decision. And without playing those what-if games with them, you know, what if you did say yes and gave away your contact details? You know, how does that affect you? How does that affect other people in your contact list? Without getting that information across to people in a way that they can understand and going down the chain, I think you know, we're going to have more of a, a problem. Um, one, one of the tweets I saw was, you know, how can we turn this net hooey into a net dewey? So I'd, I'd love to hear from the room as to how they'd be getting these messages across, because schools and, and other places where we can hit a lot of people um, with information are great, but how do we get into them? Because technology is not uh, well distributed, as Nat was saying this morning. I just wanted to pick up a couple of strands of the discussion. Um, there's been a little bit of a feel about control, um, as, as well as sort of a, a, a them and us sort of feel to some of the discussion. I don't think a strategy is trying to control anything. Um, it ought to be a, a series of, of steps that get to an end goal um, rather than some sort of document that controls what people do online. Um, the other thing about the sort of them and us element, I think it's really important as, as one of the steps in the strategy to get industry on board. Um, industry have, you know, have the, the part to play in, in terms of the safety element because um, a lot of industry now have access to, to our data. Well, we give them access. Um, and then and then they store that access. I mean, it would be very easy to get the likes of, of Facebook or, or Trade Me um, on as industry reps in terms of, of trust and safety. But um, I think there's a, a number of other industry players that, um, that sh should be part of that strategy um, and, and should be able to feed into it, um, both at the end of, of having our data and knowing what to do with it or how to protect it, um, as well as the, the innovation um, element of of new software and new things that will come. I, I think the, th the them and us thing is really important. Um, at, at the NetHui, the uh, policy people for Google and uh, Facebook are here uh, and uh, you know partaking in these things. So you know, I mean, they're obviously the sort of names that come up a lot because they're the products that we use, but they are also trying to actively engage. And of course, Trade Me is here as always. Google's here. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, and that's, uh, and I think that's, uh, that's been one of the successes of, of the, the organically grown strategy around cyber safety in New Zealand that, that it has included uh, those agencies as well. So they've been part of what's happened thus far. I, <laughs> I think we've come to a natural conclusion. <laughs> and it's um, two minutes to quarter past, so uh, I, I'm happy to, to end it there. Uh, just to say that, that um, those of you that are particularly interested in this conversation and how it develops, uh, NetSafe is holding a, a, a conference, a two-day conference in Wellington, uh, November the 26th and 27th. Uh, there'll be more information on our website at some point in the very near future. So, uh, so you can uh, register for that and uh, come along and watch this develop. Okay, uh, thanks very much for your input. Appreciate it.